It may sound curious to the foreigners, and perhaps treacherous to the Indians, but there is no exaggeration in saying that Indians themselves were in a larger measure responsible for the treatment they received at British hands. Thanks to the incessant and skillful propaganda of Indian politicians, particularly of the Congress affiliation, the world heard much of the politically minded, sophisticated, brave Indians who always stood manfully against the Raj, sometimes brought it to a standstill, and often caused much concern to the British Empire. The fact is that for an overwhelming majority of Indians, the Raj was no menace to be opposed tooth and nail, nor was there much virtue in political agitation and bomb-throwing. These people lived their normal lives and left the excitement and risks of politics to those who loved that kind of thing. The picture drawn by expert publicists, showing a vast, seething mass, desperate with frustration and impatient to throw off the foreign yoke, is like a modern abstract painting which conveys everything to the man who painted it and nothing to the viewer. The average Indian marched on to his destiny, placid, encompassed by small anxieties which made up his life, loving peace and quiet and good weather so that his two meals arrived without interruption, grateful to his maker for whatever the new day brought, without ambition, without extravagant hopes, used to a succession of foreign rulers, reconciled to the position fate had allotted him, in a way even happy in his small world. He was not sensitive to gusts of political change. He was not even sure if change would bring a difference to his lot. His ancestors had seen changes of bewildering rapidity, but for him, nothing had really changed. He was simple-hearted, but he was certainly not a fool. He knew where his interest lay, and for the time being he knew that it did not lay in opposing a rule about which he neither knew nor cared much, and which anyway left him in relative peace. This means that normally he did not give much thought to how the Englishmen behaved. It was a foreign race which now ruled the land, and a white race to boot, and alien people had alien manners and mores. So he tolerated much at the hands of the British, which he would not have accepted from his own people. And parts of India had been rescued by the white man from abominable repression. Look at the Punjab under the Sikhs, where a great majority of people lived in terror by night and despair by day. What else could they do but welcome the British with a sigh of pleasure and gratitude? The Indians have one virtue. They are not ungrateful. So the deliverer was shown respect, and even when someone misbehaved, they overlooked it, and preferred to remember the gentleman who had been kind, rather than the boar whom power had turned mad. There was also a class of not inconsiderable size, which, insensitive to rough treatment and untouched by self-respect, brought its unstinted tribute of obedience to the ruler's threshold. The white man's smile was their highest reward. The white man's favor was their highest ambition. To shake hands with the white man was an experience whose smallest details lived in the memory of a generation. In the presence of the white man, they bowed low as if there were hinges in their backs. British arrogance meant nothing to people of this temperament who had lived for centuries in a country where the arrogance of power was an immortal tradition. In parentheses, it must be mentioned that after the freedom, most Indians and Pakistanis are still mentally a slave to the white. It is not uncommon to find a junior functionary spontaneously rising in his seat to welcome a supplicant of white skin and reserving his harsh, officious aspect for men of his own race. Several scholars in South Asia have bitterly complained of discriminatory treatment shown to them by their own governments. Senior local men have been brusquely turned away with an eloquently unhelpful shrug of shoulders. The foreign white scholar, in many cases merely a postgraduate student, has usually managed not only to read confidential papers, but to reproduce full texts of classified documents in his books. The fact that British arrogance was largely a product of Indian cringing to the white ruler is further illustrated by what we have already said about the difference between the Englishman's treatment of those whom he found self-respecting and those whom he found spineless. He gave to each what in his opinion they deserved, equality and respect to one, contempt and scorn to the other. Only an unmitigated fool will fawn upon his master, and then whine that the master is overbearing. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and social media and support at Patreon. Thank you.